Hi guys, subscribe to my channel now so that you do not forget. Hit that bell icon and get notified of my further uploads. Lastly, feel free to comment. Show me some love by giving me a thumbs up at the end of the video. Good morning guys and welcome back to my channel. And we are at last going to start again with, um, to continue with the first eight series. Um, I was busy with wounds and everything last time and unfortunately I had to cut it short because of external noises and so on and so forth. So today we'll do the second half of the first eight video called Wound Care. I've got some material written down today for reference. So if I look down onto the, if I look down it's because I'm reading, okay, not being rude. So uh, today we are talking about wound care. But before we do, here's some uh, messages for you. Please head over to my webpage at www.cryptzone.co.za and come and check out the page. You will notice there is a lot of information on there. Hyperlinks are provided so that you don't have a problem going anywhere. Head up to my podcast page and come and see what am I currently working on on my podcast. There is also the CryptoZone live page, which I will update regularly to let you know when I'm going to do the next show like this one. The goal is to try and do one every week. Head on over to my CryptoZone YouTube page and come and check out what are the latest videos that I am working on and also what new videos is up and coming. If you have any queries or questions, don't hesitate to ask. You can email me at shoal.reaper at gmail.com Wound care A minor wound should be cleaned and help to prevent infection. So our biggest concern is infection. Wound cleaning usually restarts the bleeding by disrupting the blood clotting. So you know when you um, cut yourself or when uh, you're starting to heal it makes a scab. So that is caused by platelets in the blood. Now as your platelet starts healing the, the wound or closing the wound Eh, you're going to start cleaning it and you're going to disrupt that so you're going to open up the wound again when you clean it. So it's going to start bleeding again. For severe bleeding, leave the pressure bandage in place until the victim can get medical care. To clean a shallow wound, do the following. First, wash the wound with soap and water. Flush the wound with running water under pressure. Now that doesn't mean like take a hose pipe and put your finger there. Just uh, open the water nice and strongly, okay? You need to get that, that fine dirt and stones or whatever, depending on what happened, out of the wound. So it's good to use, uh, to use uh, a bit of pressure on your water. Remove small objects that are not flushed out with sterile tweezers. If bleeding restarts, apply direct pressure over the wound. And always remember to wear your gloves, wear PPE, no? before you start this. Apply an antibiotic ointment, that can be Savalon, Dettol, Betadine, anything. And betadine is actually very good. Betadine works very nice. Cover the area with sterile and, if possible, non-stick dressing. Change the dressing and bandage periodically, so let's say every day, once a day. And seek medical care for a wound with a high risk of infection, such as an animal bite or puncture. Now, if you had any um, nails, old screws, anything in you that's got rust, you're going to have to go and get a, a Tativex or tetanus injection. And if it is a dog bite, you're definitely going to go to theater because those guys clean and disinfect the wound um, in theater itself. Caution. Do not pull a scab loose to change the dressing. If a bandage sticks, use some warm water or luke water to wetten the bandage and to make it soft and then it will come off without actually tearing off the scab with it. Wound infection. Any wound, large or small, can become infected. Seek medical care for infected wounds. The sign for a wound that may be infected includes the following. So this is what you look at if a wound is suspected of being infected. You're looking at the rest. Swelling and redness around the area. You know when people say the wound looks angry? because it's very red and swollen, that could be a sign of infection. A sensation of warmth, so it can be cold and then when you get closer to that actual cut, it feels like the cut is warm, that's another sign. A throbbing pain, a pus discharge, is that like a yellow gooey stuff coming out. Fever, swelling of lymph nodes, and then uh, red streaks leading from the wound towards the heart. Yeah, I have personally never seen that, but um, that's not good. 
Now remember we spoke about uh, tetanus just now? So what is tetanus? Tetanus is caused by a bacterium that can provide a powerful poisonous toxin. And when it enters a wound, the toxin causes contractions of certain muscles, muscle groups, particularly in the jaw. There is no known cure for the toxin. In uh, my language, in Afrikaans, we call it clemenicoc. It's because you clench, your jaw clenches. So that's because of this tetanus. Because of this danger, everyone needs an initial series of vaccinations to defend against the toxin. A booster shot every 10 years is sufficient to maintain immunity. Although anyone with a dirty wound or an animal bite should get a booster shot right away. Tetanus immunization shots must be given within 72 hours of the injury to be effective. Special wounds. Under our special wounds, there are two main things that you have to look at. Called amputations. Embedded objects. Or impalement. If that makes sense. Now, amputations is a loss of a body part. You are working with a saw and zip, there goes your finger. Or you have a worse accident and zip, there goes your arm. Now, just a little bit of lightheartedness. I had a patient once who lost his arm. Um, he was quickly going to remove a rock from a conveyor belt and his uh, arm got caught in the pulley and it ripped his arm off. Unfortunately, the doctor couldn't reattach his arm because of the way that the arm tore off. Um, if an arm gets severed nicely and a straight line, then the striations or the muscles can be reattached much easier. But if it's a mangled mess, it won't work. That was the first reason. The second reason is the way that the people treated the arm was not right. I'm going to tell you now exactly how do you treat an amputated pot to make sure that it can be reattached if it's cut nicely, as I told you. So what these guys did wrong is they put it in a plastic bag and inside a blanket. And that caused the, the tissue and the meat to get warm and then eventually was not viable anymore to be used. But what was funny is um, we put the patient in to the, to the casualty room and I was carrying his arm like this. And the first thing the patient told the doctor was, Hi, Doc. I would have liked to greet you by hand, but unfortunately, he's holding my arm. That was funny. So, how do you treat an amputated pot? First of all, control the bleeding. Give the patient care for shock. That means warm him up and so on. Recover the amputated part and wrap it in a dry sterile gauze or a clean cloth. Place the wrapped amputated part in a glass in a plastic bag and other waterproof container, which is what which is fine. And keep the pot cool. Now this is what they didn't do, you must keep it cool. For example, use ice or cold packs, but do not freeze it. You must keep it cool. That that keeps it fresh. If you you know, if you use a freezer, you want to keep your meat fresh, keep it cool. Now, for your information, cooling amputated pots. Amputated body parts that remain uncooled for more than 6 hours have little chance of survival. 18 hours is probably the maximum time allowable for the pot that has been cooled properly. Muscles without blood loses viability within 4-6 to six hours. As I said, what they did wrong is they put it in a blanket. And the blanket made it warm. And you don't want it warm, you want it cool. Then... Uh, Impaled objects or embedded objects. Objects such as glass, knives and nails can be embedded in the body. To, so yeah, that obviously, if you get stabbed, pff, there's a knife. If you trip and fall and you can get a rebar stuck through you. So embed, in, impalement is quite, not common, but it's, it happens. So first you must expose the area. Remove or cut away cloth that surrounds that area. Do not remove the object. Never, ever, ever pull the object out. You can cause more damage while you pull the object out and you can cause more bleeding. A patient can actually bleed to death because you took it out. And do not remove the object. Movement of any kind could produce additional bleeding and tissue damage. Control any bleeding with pressure around the object. So you can make a, a pressure bandage, ring bandage, which we'll probably talk about later. You put it around the object and then you bandage it up. Uh, I've got some bandages here, so I'll show you some... Um, uh, examples when we eventually get to talk about bandages or methods. 
Stabilize the object with bulky dressings or clean cloth around the object and then shorten the object only if necessary. So let's say there's a rebar sticking out, the ground is here and the guy fell through it and you can't get him out, then you should try and cut off the bottom part and let him go. If it's too long, then cut the pieces off. Just try and put stuff around it so that you don't burn the patient. Always reaffirm and uh, reassure the patient, calm him down and always tell him exactly what you're doing. Remember, people are scared. If they don't know what's happening, talk to them and tell them exactly what you're doing and why you are, do why you are doing it. So uh, let's just talk about some wounds that require medical care. So wounds that need medical care are as follows. Wounds that will not stop bleeding after five minutes. Even if you apply direct pressure, it's like squirting everywhere. Long or deep cuts that need stitches. Cuts over a joint. Cuts that may impair function of the body area, such as the eyelids or lips. Cuts that remove all of the layers of the skin, such as those from slicing of the tip of a finger and cuts from an animal bite or human bite yes they say actually humans has got more germs in their bites than dogs so humans are filthier in their mouths than dogs believe it or not cuts that have damaged underlying nerves tendons and joints cuts over possible broken bones cuts caused by crushing injury Cuts with an object embedded in them. Cuts caused by major objects or a puncture wound. Call backup immediately, so call an ambulance immediately. If the bleeding from the cut does not slow down, first 50 minutes of steady direct pressure. Signs of shock occur. Breathing is difficult because of a cut to the neck or chest. A deep cut to the abdomen caused moderate to severe pain. A cut to the eyeball. A cut amputates or partially amputates an extremity, then you yeah. take him and you go to hospital if you can. Otherwise, if you can't move him, we don't want to move him, get an ambulance there as soon as possible. So uh, let's just quickly talk about dressings and bandages. So yeah, as you know, first aid kits are always coming with different sizes and types and so of, of bandages. It doesn't really matter what type of bandage you put on, as long as it's going to be big enough to cover the entire wound at the top and the bottom of that wound. Okay, a dressing is a covering that is placed directly over a wound to help absorb blood, prevent inf infection, and to protect the wound from further injury. Dressings can in different shapes, sizes, and types. So, well, dressings can be gauze pads um, used to cover large wounds, or adhesive strips such as band-aids, which in dressings combined with a bandage for small cuts or scraps. A bandage such as a roll, of gauze, a roll of gauze, or often used to cover dressings to keep it in place in the wound, and to apply pressure to help control the bleeding. Like dressings, bandages also come in different shapes and sizes, and materials. Elastic bandages can be used to prevent support and stabilize for an extremity or joint on to reduce swelling. So, when it comes to a dressing, you don't want to put it on too tightly, and you don't want to put it on too loosely. If it's too loose, it's going to fall off. If it's too tight, you can cause the following. A blue tinge to the fingernail or toenails, which means it's getting blue, it's not getting blood circulation going. Blue or pale skin. A tingling or loss of sensation and coldness of the extremity. You have to remove that bandage or loosen it because if that continues, that guy can lose that finger or lose that part of the body because it doesn't get blood, it starves and then it dies. Okay. Okay, and then just some last, just a last thing for your information, just some, something that's uh, for interesting. About stitches, all I'm going to say about suturing is that if you think, if you feel, if you think that the wound is too deep and you're not sure if it should get stitches, rather take them to the doctor and let the doctor decide. If there's pieces of fat coming out or you can see the bone, then obviously you're going to need stitches. If it's a superficial cut, it's not too deep, it stops bleeding within five minutes or so, and it's not too big, put a normal band-aid on it or a plaster and keep it closed. If you do need to put stitches, it needs to be put in within six to eight hours of the wound.
So that's it, guys. That's then the end of this uh, episode of First Aid Level 1. And I hope you enjoyed it. So uh, please, if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you want to comment about something or ask me something, please do. And then uh, remember to subscribe to this channel. And I will be coming back with the next chapter next week, I hope. If everything goes well. I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, that's me until next time. Cheers.